Hi once again. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, in this lecture about uh, the last reading that we have on our course. Uh, it's Eric Auerbach's uh, brilliant brief essay on the scar of Odysseus, which is the introductory chapter in his, um, in his very brilliant and famous book, first published in 1946 under the title of uh, Mimesis. Uh, in Auerbach, we are looking uh, somewhat unusually, of course, uh, in uh, this course that we have been on, we are looking at somebody who is a professional scholar of uh, not English, but uh, European uh, literature in general. Um, he, he might not have called himself a, 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 a critic as such, but he would have called himself a, a philologist. Uh, so somebody uh, who is to literature as... Uh, as a philosopher is to the great texts of that tradition, but basically uh, we're looking again at a, a, a highly trained, uh, professional, mature literary scholar uh, with Auerbach. Um, <clears throat> the essay that we are looking at uh, takes us to the late 1930s. Um, Auerbach wrote this piece and wrote his whole book, Mimesis, uh, in exile from the Nazis. So he's a, he's a Jewish German scholar who was dismissed from his positions in 1936 and uh, reading the writing on the wall, so to speak, he fled Germany and uh, spent the war years uh, in Istanbul. So uh, a, a brilliant man, an exceedingly learned man, exceedingly cultured man, um, in exile, uh, in his 40s, uh, not knowing certainly what's going to happen um, in the war, uh, probably when, when Auerbach is writing our essay on the scar of Odysseus, uh, in exile from home, from language, from culture, from job, uh, even in exile from his profession, even from his books. Um, and um, I, I, it, I, it's, it's as though Auerbach starts this great project by kind of looking back uh, at what has happened to him, thinking about uh, what he's lost, uh, and asking himself what it was all about. It uh, being that literary phenomenon to which uh, he has already, by that point, devoted what must have seemed like his whole life. What was it good for? Um, and Auerbach uh, comes up with uh, an answer, uh, which is uh, that it was good for, it was all about the representation of uh, reality. It was all about mimesis. That's what those texts did. Uh, and it may seem uh, at the very beginning that that's... Um, either kind of begging the question, so uh, obviously uh, representation of literature is, is significant uh, for its function of representation. It may seem, seem uninformative, but I don't think uh, it is. Um, it is the obvious answer that sort of emerges, this topic of mimesis for Auerbach. Uh, but what he's going to do uh, is invite us and help us to see uh, this obvious answer um, in a new way or maybe see it all over again. He's going to give us a chance to recognize uh, what's at stake uh, in the phenomenon of mimesis, the representation of reality, at least in European literature. Uh, and it is highly appropriate, uh, therefore, that Auerbach begins this whole great work uh, with a very famous story of recognition, and it's one that we are already familiar with uh, in our course. It is the famous moment from uh, the Odyssey book 19, uh, when Odysseus, in disguise as a beggar, has returned to his own house, uh, ha has already engaged in various conversations with his wife Penelope, but is not recognized by her uh, and uh, as Auerbach sets up this episode, uh, 
Um, it comes to a moment that always occurs, uh, of course, in the Homeric world where the guest, that's what Odysseus is, the guest uh, is presented uh, with a certain form of hospitality. In this case, it's uh, having his feet washed. His old uh, nurse, Eurycleia, um, uh, is ordered to wash uh, his feet. Uh, at exactly that point, Odysseus realizes, oh, oh I've got a problem. Uh, because there's this scar on my thigh that I got when I was a when I was a boy, uh, and uh, Eurycleia was my nurse then. She knows that scar. She knows I'm the only person who has this scar. It must be quite a scar. Uh, and therefore, when she touches when when she washes my feet, she's going to touch my scar and she's going to recognize me. Um, that, of course, does happen. Eurycleia does recognize him, uh, and uh, she has to be hushed up by Odysseus. The story then goes on uh, for a long time, um, with Odysseus remaining in disguise until his eventual slaughter of the suitors uh, to Penelope uh, and his final recognition by her uh, in Book 23 of the book uh, of the Odyssey. Uh, that's where Auerbach starts, that, that famous moment in Homer. Uh, and he makes two points about it, uh, two points to begin with. Um, first, Auerbach um, you know, kind of steps back from this story, which he certainly would know backwards and forwards, and he's probably known it since he was a boy. And he makes just a really cool observation about the way this story works. And when I say the way this story works, that's nothing kind of abstract or sophisticated or philosophical. I simply mean, and Auerbach simply means, how the story is told, the structure, the logic of the story. Uh, and uh, the uh, initial insight that he has, again, is that in the Homeric narrative, and this episode that we're talking about in Odyssey 19 is absolutely typical of Homeric narrative in that regard, and that's important. It's not special in Homer. This is how Homer always works. This is just kind of a spectacular example of the way Homer always works uh, narratively. In this little scene that we just have been talking about uh, with Odysseus in disguise, Penelope, the nurse, etc., everything is shown. Um, and again, that's totally characteristic of, of Homeric narrative. And I, I can't possibly improve on the way that Auerbach puts it, so I'm going to read this. It's at the bottom of page three uh, in our PDF. Uh, and I will say parenthetically that um, Auerbach's essay here on the Scar of Odysseus is certainly that rare uh, instance of literary discussion, literary criticism that is just so beautifully and powerfully written, it absolutely merits being considered as a literary experience in its own right. Anyway, uh, Auerbach expresses the point that I'm trying to explain as follows. He says, all this is scrupulously externalized and narrated in leisurely fashion. The two women, Penelope and Eurycleia, the two women express their feelings in copious direct discourse, feelings though they are, with only a slight admixture of the most general considerations upon human destiny. The syntactical connection between part and part is perfectly clear. No contour is blurred. There is also room and time for orderly, perfectly well-articulated, uniformly illuminated descriptions of implements, ministrations, and gestures even in the dramatic moment of recognition, Homer does not omit to tell the reader that it is with his right hand that Odysseus takes the old woman by the throat to keep her from speaking at the same time that he draws her closer to him with his left. Clearly outlined, brightly and uniformly illuminated, men and things stand out in a realm where everything is vi visible and not less clear, wholly expressed, orderly even in their ardor, are uh, the feelings and thoughts of the persons involved. This is Auerbach's initial and opening insight. In the Homeric narrative, everything is shown. Everything is shown up to and including the feelings and the inner thoughts or lives of the characters in the scenario, and nothing is beneath showing. Nothing is beneath receiving full, careful, detailed narrative treatment up to and including the uh, items of furniture in the room, like that basin in which she's washing 
Odysseus's feet up to and including the careful and as it were uh, totally non-dramatic detail of which hand Odysseus uses dramatically to grasp uh, the old woman so he can silence her and prevent her um, from uh, blowing his cover. Now this is the insight that uh, Auerbach has had. It is one that I think startles him, delights him, fascinates him. Um, and so it's a kind of, it's a kind of live jumping thing, uh, this insight that he has had. And accordingly, he comes back to it repeatedly in the early pages of this essay, uh, giving it uh, formulation after formulation. So for example, at the bottom of page four, uh, Auerbach, Auerbach gives this brilliant kind of summary version of his insight. He says, Homer knows no background. Wonderful, powerful statement. Uh, at the bottom of page five, Auerbach speaks of the need of the need of the Homeric style to leave nothing which it mentions half in darkness and unexternalized. And I'll just read one more of Auerbach's various attempts to kind of nail down or finalize this first insight uh, that he is sharing with us uh, at the bottom of page seven. He says, uh, the Homeric style knows only a foreground, only a uniformly illuminated, uniformly objective uh, present. Uh, so this, uh, oh, oh, and by the way, Auerbach keeps, keeps using the word style uh, which may be a slightly misleading word for us. It makes it sound as though we're, we're dealing with something relatively trivial. We're, we're, we're really not. Uh, we're dealing uh, in Auerbach uh, with a fundamental insight about the way in which Homer represents the world, the way he shows it, the way Homeric mimesis uh, works. That's what's at stake here, the very nature or shape or structure of Homeric representation. And this insight that, that Auerbach has and that he's trying to share with us is that Homeric representation or Homeric mimesis is a, is a mimesis of surfaces. Everything is shown and everything must be shown. Uh, and everything that is shown is shown almost at the same level or, or with the same degree of uh, importance. Okay, that's the first uh, insight. Uh, that Auerbach has about this episode in Homer and about Homeric narrative uh, in general. The second insight that he has, the second point he wants to share, is is distinct, but it, it really at the same time is kind of a it, it's kind of an underlining or a repetition or 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 a re-emphasis of uh, the first uh, insight. Uh, Auerbach uh, points out um, something that I hope. Uh, struck you when uh, when I read actually Odyssey 19 uh, much earlier in our course and I hope this you this may have struck you again when you went back to glance uh, at the text uh, Auerbach points out there's this weird thing about the uh, recognition of Odysseus scene in Odyssey 19 the weird thing is uh, Eurycleia the old nurse is going to recognize Odysseus because of that scar. That's the setup. Odysseus realizes, oh no, she's going to recognize me. She does recognize him. Uh, but that's not all we get, of course, uh, in uh, Homer's telling. Quite the contrary. When Eurycleia touches that scar, uh, it's not just she touches the scar and the episode moves on. No, she touches the scar and we go in to an incredible digression. A whole story of how Homer uh, excuse me, of how Odysseus got uh, that scar. And again, I cannot possibly improve on the way Auerbach explains this, so I'm going to read it now from the top of page four uh, in our PDF. Auerbach says, In my account of the incident, I have so far passed over a whole series of verses which interrupted in the middle. There are more than 70 of these verses, while to the incident itself, some 40 are devoted before the interruption and some 40 after it. So the digression is almost as long as the main or framing story. The interruption, which comes just at the point when the housekeeper recognizes the scar, that is, at the moment of crisis, describes the origin of the scar, 
a hunting accident which occurred in Odysseus's boyhood at a boar hunt during the time of his visit to his grandfather Autolycus. This first affords an opportunity to inform the reader about Autolycus, his house, the precise degree of his kinship, his character, and no less exhaustively than touchingly, his behavior after the birth of his grandson. Then follows the visit of Odysseus, now grown to be a youth, the exchange of greetings, the banquet with which he is welcomed, sleep and waking, the early start for the hunt, the tracking of the beast, the struggle, Odysseus is being wounded by the boar's tusk, his recovery, his return to Ithaca, his parents' anxious questions, all is narrated. Again, with such a complete externalization of all the elements of the story and of their, interconne and of their interconnections as to leave nothing in obscurity. Not until then do, does the narrator return to Penelope's chamber. Not until then, the digression having run its course, does Eurycleia, who has recognized the scar before the digression began, let Odysseus's foot fall back into the basin. Auerbach's incredible account of that incredible moment uh, in Odyssey uh, 19. Uh, and we can make two points ourselves uh, with the help of Auerbach about what he uh, is saying here and how he flushes out uh, his discussion of this famous moment uh, in Homer. First of all, Auerbach was on uh, to, uh, to, to point out and to insist that, that this, this moment in, in Homer, this technique in Homer, <laughs> in Homer uh, <laughs> this aspect of the Homeric narrative, it has nothing to do with suspense, right? Uh, and uh, Auerbach, uh, as it were, recognizes, well, we might, because of our assumptions about how stories work, we might think, oh, yeah, that's, that's suspense. You know, that's, that, that's like when, you know, you, you try to drag out the scene in a dramatic way, you know, Odysseus inching his chair back <laughs> from Eurycleia, Eurycleia's, uh, you know, gnarled hand reaching out to him. Is she going to touch the scar or not? Uh, or we could even imagine, if it were a different kind of text, we could imagine a kind of comedic version of suspense, right? Where Odysseus would say something like, um, oh, you know what? I just remembered. I already had my feet washed today. <laughs> something like that. But no, 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 Auerbach says. It's nothing to do uh, with suspense. In fact, he makes this wonderful point that when we go into the digression on Odysseus's scar, actually all of the tension goes out of uh, the critical moment because we kind of forget about it. We go into this whole long story about, uh, about the scar, which takes on its own life and has its own energy. Um, neither is there any contradiction to the point that we made a moment ago, that Auerbach made a moment ago, about Homer having no background. Auerbach says there's no background world to the Homeric narrative. Um, uh, in the case of, of the scar of Odysseus, which we go back and learn so much about, yes, uh, it, its backstory, it, it's from long ago. Uh, but the whole point is, and the whole point that Auerbach is trying to draw out, is uh, that when Homer starts telling that backstory, uh, that is the story he now is telling. Uh, and, and that's, as it were, the only story that there is while he uh, is telling it. The backstory isn't uh, something you kind of zoom way back to and then zoom back out from. It's more like uh, you just turn a page from uh, uh, Eurycleia about to touch that scar and you find yourself reading a, a, another story which is illuminated in exactly the same way, uh, no, no, no dimmer, no brighter, it is exactly as important, no more, no less, than uh, the framing story that we were just uh, reading. Uh, and again, we'll turn to Auerbach himself for the best possible explanation of this point. Uh, and again, from the bottom of page four, Homer, as we've already seen Auerbach saying, Homer knows no background. What he narrates is for the time being the only present and fills both the stage and the reader's mind completely. So it is with the passage before us. When the young Eurycleia, in the digression, when the young Eurycleia sets the infant Odysseus 
on his grandfather Autolycus's lap after the banquet, the aged Eurycleia, who a few lines earlier had touched the wanderer's foot, has entirely vanished from the stage and from uh, the reader's mind. Uh, and uh, uh, one more, uh, uh, or maybe two more, um, passage in Auerbach uh, as he, again, struggles somewhat to control this incredible live jumping uh, insight that he has had uh, at, the bo at the top, excuse me, of page six. Uh, Auerbach writes, here is the scar which comes up in the course of the narrative as, as Eurycleia prepares to wash Odysseus's feet. Here is the scar which comes up in the course of the narrative and Homer's feelings simply will not permit him to see it appear out of the darkness of an unilluminated past. It must be set in full light, and with it, a portion of the hero's boyhood. Uh, and uh, Auerbach goes on here to, to make the point that this thing that happens in Odyssey 19 is not an odd thing in Homer. It's actually totally typical of Homer, and he gives a whole bunch of other examples uh, where Homeric narrative works uh, in the same way. We can skip over those and just uh, go to something that uh, Auerbach says, or a couple of things he says on uh, page 7. Top of page 7, he kind of sums up by saying, so he's, he's looking back over uh, all these examples that he has just, uh, from memory, uh, cited from uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he writes, this procession of phenomena takes place in the foreground, that is, in a local and temporal present, which is absolute. Uh, and skipping down to the bottom of that page, he writes, the Homeric style knows only a foreground, only a uniformly illuminated, uniformly objective present. So, um, in Homer, when we move, from uh, the story to the backstory. It's not like we're going from a, a kind of foreground to a background, from what's brightly lit to what's dimly lit. No, we're just going from foreground to foreground, from story to story. Uh, they have exactly the same kind of rhythm and, and timbre and coloring. Uh, these stories, whether they are in the present or in the past, are exactly the same kind of story with exactly the same kind of uh, status. And indeed, in Homer, to make the same point another way, we never really go from the present of the narrative to a past that is behind it. We only go from the present of the narrative to another present of the narrative, from which we then may move back to the first present uh, as though nothing has happened, no time shift has occurred. Homeric narrative is all one level. Uh, that is the nature of Homeric representation, and that is the uh, point that Auerbach is trying to make about it. Now, uh, he goes on to uh, fill in this point by way, then, of a contrast. And it's a contrast that's probably already uh, in his mind uh, as the very basis for the insight he's having about Homer, but um, nonetheless, he then brings this contrast very famously, uh, very brilliantly, uh, into uh, view. Uh, it is a contrast between the Homeric style, as Auerbach says, so the, the nature of Homeric narrative, the nature of Homeric representation. It's a contrast between that mimesis and another mimesis, an entirely different kind, uh, which Auerbach uh, draws from another set of ancient stories, a set of ancient stories, which, as he points out, is, is roughly contemporaneous with uh, the origins of the Homeric epics. Auerbach turns from Homer to the stories of the Old Testament uh, in uh, the Bible. Um, and uh, the, the Old Testament, of course, is nothing other than, at least for the first two thirds of it or so, it's nothing other than a, a collection of stories. And, and we should not be so naive uh, as to suppose, if we do, uh, or if this thought crosses our mind, we should not suppose that, you know, uh, just because it's the Bible and we, we may not uh, be religious, they're nothing to do uh, with us. Uh, but let's come back to that point later on. For now, let's just note this incredible uh, 
well, turn uh, that Auerbach makes. Having done this workup of, of Homer uh, along the lines that we just have been discussing, he then brings in this contrast to uh, the Old Testament uh, narrative. Um, and specifically, he turns to a scripture, uh, a story from the book of Genesis, uh, which has artfully already been included uh, on um, the syllabus of our course. Uh, it is the story of Abraham and Isaac uh, from Genesis 22. Um, and I won't read too much of this, but um, uh, just a little bit, uh, maybe from the top of page 8, Auerbach starts to talk about uh, the Genesis 22 story. Uh, he says, The King James Version translates the opening as follows, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. That's the quote from Genesis on which Auerbach comments, even this opening startles us when we come to it from Homer. Where are the two speakers? We are not told. The reader, however, knows that they are not normally to be found together in one place on earth, that one of them, God, in order to speak to Abraham, must come from somewhere, must enter the earthly realm from some unknown heights or depths. Whence does he come? Whence does he call to Abraham? We are not told. He does not come, like Zeus or Poseidon, from the Ethiopians, where he has been enjoying a sacrificial feast. Nor are we told anything of his reasons for tempting Abraham so terribly. He has not, like Zeus, discussed them in set speeches with other gods gathered in council, nor have the deliberations in his own heart been presented to us, unexpected and mysterious. He enters the scene from some own unknown height or depth and calls Abraham. Uh, and I'll skip down a bit, uh, the next paragraph, uh, where Auerbach takes his incredible uh, um, interpretative lens and turns it to the other member, main member of this story, Abraham himself. Uh, he says, this becomes still clearer if we now turn to the other person in the dialogue, to Abraham. Where is he? We do not know. He says, indeed, here I am, but the Hebrew word means only something like behold me and in any case is not meant to indicate the actual place where Abraham is, but a moral position in respect to God, who was called to him, Here am I awaiting thy command. Where is he at? Where he is actually, whether in Beersheba or elsewhere, whether indoors or in the open air is not stated. It does not interest the narrator. The reader is not informed. And Auerbach's brilliant analysis of uh, this Old Testament story an analysis which, by the way, and this is something that we really need to notice, consists in nothing other than seeing what is evident, right? What is staring you in the face and obvious on the page. And what is staring you in the face and obvious on the page, if that page is the page of Genesis 22, especially, as Auerbach says, if you have just been reading a lot of Homer, what is staring you in the face and on the page is just how little is on that page in Genesis, how little we are told uh, in that story, how much is left in darkness. Uh, and uh, Auerbach extends this analysis into all the corners of, uh, of the Genesis 22 story. He says very marvelously that, you know, if you go back and read that story in Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac, uh, they saddle up donkeys and they travel for three days to get to the mountain where Abraham is supposed to sacrifice Isaac. They've got various serving men in them. Uh, uh, Auerbach says wonderfully uh, that the serving men do not even admit an adjective. <laughs> it's not even diligent serving men or lazy serving men or fat serving men or whatever. No, nothing uh, is what we are told about them and nothing also about uh, the... Uh, three-day journey um, uh, at the bottom of uh, page nine. Uh, Abraham and his followers rose early in the morning and went unto the place of which God had told him. On the third day, he lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And what are we told about what happens uh, on that three-day journey? Absolutely nothing. Uh, as Auerbach comments at the top now of page 10 in our text, he writes, Thus the journey is like a silent progress through the indeterminate and the contingent, a holding of the breath, a process which has no present, which is inserted like a blank duration between what has passed 
and what lies ahead, and which yet is measured. Three days. Uh, three days of nothingness. Three days that the narrative, the Old Testament narrative, uh, 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 leaves uh, in, in, in total uh, darkness. Um, and Auerbach then summarizes his point at the bottom of page 11, writing, uh, it would be difficult to imagine styles more contrasted than those of these two equally ancient and equally epic texts, Homer and the Old Testament, Book of Genesis specifically. On the one hand, in Homer, externalized, uniformly illuminated phenomena at a definite time and in a definite place, connected together without lacunae, that means gaps, without lacunae in a perpetual foreground, thoughts and feeling completely expressed, events taking place in leisurely fashion and with very little of suspense. On the other hand, in the Old Testament narrative, the externalization, the showing, the externalization of only so much of the phenomena as is necessary for the purpose of the narrative, all else left in obscurity. The decisive points of the narrative alone are emphasized. What lies between is non-existent. Time and place are undefined and call for interpretation. Thoughts and feeling remain unexpressed, are only suggested by the silence and the fragmentary speeches, the whole permeated with the most unrelieved suspense and directed toward a single goal, and to that extent far more of a unity, remains mysterious and fraught with background. That is the brilliant comparative insight that Auerbach, probably working from memory in Istanbul in the late 1930s, draws out of his previous life and all his uh, learning and work as a literary scholar and makes the starting point uh, for his book-length examination of the representation of reality in the uh, Western tradition. Uh, let's ourselves take a step back from Auerbach's argument, that summary of it, uh, that we've just uh, seen him giving, and let's say, okay, well, what are we getting uh, here? What are we getting out of this admittedly brilliant and often, I think, very moving essay? Um, what's it good for? Well, we could uh, make some observations about what Auerbach tells us about the nature of, uh, of the European tradition uh, itself. Um, so we could say that Auerbach reminds us that what we vaguely call the Western tradition is not monolithic, is not one, is not even actually very coherent at all. It's actually exceedingly diverse, uh, competing traditions held together uh, in what is or was actually a very... Um, unstable mixture, uh, as Auerbach just has pointed out, the world, so to speak, of Homer could not be more different from the world, uh, so to speak, of Genesis in the Old Testament, and, let, and yet these two texts, these two worlds are held together uh, in the same kind of uh, canonical totality. Uh, that's uh, a very interesting, I think, aspect of uh, the history of that part of uh, the world. And so we could draw out of Auerbach this kind of insight in, in cultural history, and that would be, I think, worth doing. But I think there's something more worth doing for in terms of what we can draw out of Auerbach, at least for the purposes uh, of our course. What are we getting out of this initial setup that Auerbach gives to his account of the representation of reality in European literature, well, we're getting, I think, a, a, a fundamental and, as it were, a priceless uh, insight, which is that we, uh, we don't speak correctly if we speak of the representation of reality and blah, 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 blah. Rather, we have to speak of the representations of reality uh, in European literature, and then broadening that point, which I think we must. Uh, whenever we turn, as we have been turning repeatedly in this course, whenever we turn to the general phenomenon of mimesis or representation, 
we actually need to start to be aware that that always has to come in the plural. It's not representation, it's representations. There's different ways of doing it, and the different ways of doing it are exceedingly and even maximally profound, uh, not only in terms of how they may strike or move us, but in terms of the intellectual and I would even say moral consequences that these different modes or ways of representation uh, have. It's simply not the case. Despite what Plato's Socrates says, that there's just one thing called mimesis, just one way to represent the world, which itself accordingly is just one. One mirror turning all around, as Plato Socrates says in Republic Book 10, uh, making you the greatest artist in the world because you, give a, you, you can easily make a picture of everything. Uh, it's not the case that there's just one kind of representation. Neither is it the case that representation is only one way. Rather, I think, and I think we get this out of Auerbach, the way the world gets represented determines what the world is, how it is experienced, how it is uh, seen. Uh, and uh, we see this in Auerbach when he turns to consider what we might call the consequences or the implications of the Homeric and biblical styles, uh, these very different ways in which uh, they represent the world. Homeric narrative, if we, if, we, if we try to summarize Auerbach's analysis in one word, uh, one adjective, we can say Homeric narrative is superficial. It is a narrative of surfaces in which everything must be brought to the surface, everything must be shown, everything is shown at the same level and, and with the same status, nothing is left in background, nothing is left in darkness, nothing is left mysterious, nothing is left deep. A narrative of surface surfaces, a superficial uh, narrative. Biblical narrative, if again we try to summarize the insight that Arabat has had, biblical narrative, Old Testament narrative uh, to be precise, is profound uh, in the literal sense of that term. It means deep. Um, uh, so if in Homer everything can and even must be seen, uh, and shown and at the same level. In the Bible, in the narrative of the Old Testament, most things must not and cannot uh, be shown. Uh, and that uh, goes on the one hand for the uh, previous lives or deep inner lives of the human characters of the Old Testament narrative. And of course, it also goes uh, for the... Uh, uh, infinite transcendent nature of God, which reaches up completely above human being and uh, not only uh, is not shown, but actually can't be shown or grasped. Um, um, so, um, and of course, so, uh, sorry, I, I got a little bit uh, stuck there. Uh, in biblical narrative, most of, of, of the world that surrounds the story is, is not shown. Uh, it, is, uh, it is unseen. And of course, the unseen, the dark, the hidden, the not shown, the unseen is the territory of the emergent. It's the territory of change. It's the territory of growth. So, uh, to go through that one more time and, and, and uh, then really make the point. Uh, uh, Homeric superficiality is, first of all, narrative. It's a characteristic of the Homeric story. But second of all, moral. And the narrative superficiality of, uh, of Homer has its whole point, so to speak, in a moral superficiality uh, that is projected by it and attends it. So we can turn on this point to page 13 uh, in Auerbach's analysis, uh, where uh, he writes, the Homeric poems then, though their intellectual, linguistic, and above all syntactical culture, appears to be so much more highly developed than the Old Testament narrative. Old Testament stories are incredibly simple, right? Uh, 
uh, Homeric stories, incredibly complex and elaborate and, and, and overwrought. Uh, they are yet comparatively simple in their picture of human beings, and no less so in their relation to the real life which they describe in general. Delight in physical existence is everything to them, and their highest aim is to make that delight perceptible to us. Between battles and passions, adventures and perils, they show us hunts, banquets, palaces and shepherds' cots, athletic contests and washing days, in order that we may see the heroes in their ordinary life, and seeing them so may take pleasure in their manner of enjoying their savory present, a savory, a present which sends strong roots down into social usages, landscape, and daily life. The Homeric narrative is exceedingly complex, but it is exceedingly superficial. And morally, this is the point that Auerbach is making, uh, the Homeric world uh, is uh, similarly superficial. Uh, physical life and the delight in physical life is everything uh, in Homer. Uh, and uh, near the bottom of uh, page 13, just below the passage I just read, uh, this real world of Homer, in, in, into which we are lured, Auerbach writes, exists for itself, contains nothing but itself. The Homeric poems conceal nothing. They contain no teaching and no secret second meaning. Superficial narrative, Lee, superficial morally and superficial interpretatively. And, and you see where this is going as we turn then back to the biblical style, uh, the biblical narrative. Uh, again, uh, we, the, the, the biblical narrative uh, is, is deep. It has all those hidden recesses, unilluminated backgrounds. And what that means for Homer, uh, for Auerbach, and I think what that means to me for us also, uh, is uh, that uh, the biblical narrative comes then with an appropriate moral uh, depth. Uh, and I think this really is a, a very beautiful and moving contrast that Auerbach draws between the morality of the Homeric world and the morality of the biblical world. By morality, I of course don't mean uh, whether nice or nasty things happen in, 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 in these worlds. Uh, I mean rather the, uh, and Auerbach means, the image, the picture, the model of human being that exists in these worlds. And again, let's turn to Auerbach's way of putting it because it is much better than any paraphrase that I could uh, provide. Um, uh, Auerbach here, I'm, I'm on page 17 now uh, in our PDF. Um, uh, and I'll pick it up from about the middle of uh, the page. Um, Auerbach writes, Herein lies the reason why the great figures of the Old Testament are so much more fully developed, so much more fraught with their own biographical past, so much more distinct as individuals than are the Homeric heroes. Achilles and Odysseus are splendidly described in many well-ordered words, epithets, uh, epithets cling to them, their emotions are constantly displayed in their words and deeds, but they have no development and their life histories are clearly set forth once and for all. Um, skipping down a bit, uh, Auerbach writes, um, even Odysseus, in whose case the long lapse of time and the many events which occurred offer so much opportunity for biographical development, shows almost nothing of it. Odysseus on his return is exactly the same as he was when he left Ithaca two decades earlier. And then Auerbach goes into this beautiful contrast uh, between the Homeric heroes and, and, and various uh, Old Testament figures, mostly drawn from the book of Genesis. Uh, not, he's no longer talking about Abraham, he's talking about Jacob, Joseph, Adam, and also talking about King David. Uh, we don't need to know these stories, I hope, to grasp the point that Auerbach is making. Uh, if the Homeric heroes show no development, because there's nowhere the development could come from, right? There's no hidden reserves of the Homeric world. Everything is always already shown. If the Homeric uh, heroes show no development, the, the, the main characters of, of biblical narrative are nothing but development. Uh, development which really has what we can call a tragic depth. So uh, Auerbach writes here at the bottom of page 17, he says, Odysseus on his return is exactly the same as he was when he left Ithaca two, de two decades earlier, but what a road, what a fate lie between the Jacob who cheated his father out of his blessing and the old man whose favorite son has been torn to pieces 
by a wild beast, between David the harp player, persecuted by his lord's jealousy, and the old king, surrounded by violent intrigues, whom Abishag the Shunammite warmed in his bed, and he knew her not. Uh, and I'm skipping down now to uh, page uh, 18, um, where Auerbach says, again, speaking of the Old Testament uh, figures, he says, fraught with their development, sometimes even aged to the verge of dissolution, they show a distinct stamp of individuality entirely foreign to the Homeric heroes. Uh, and uh, one more quote, if you'll forgive me for uh, bouncing around like this, uh, uh, still on page 18. Um, uh, Auerbach says of the, the biblical figures, humiliation and elevation go far deeper and far higher than in Homer, and they belong basically together. The poor beggar Odysseus is only masquerading in, in Book 19 of the Odyssey. The poor beggar Odysseus is only masquerading, but Adam is really cast down. Jacob, really a refugee. Joseph, really in the pit, and then a slave to be bought and sold. But their greatness rising out of humiliation is almost superhuman and an image of God's greatness. So, um, Auerbach here, almost at the very end of our course, uh, turns back to the phenomenon of representation and he perceives something which is obvious and yet um, his recognition and explication of the point is brilliant precisely because it is obvious. He perceives it's not representation, it's representations. Uh, and um, as I have been arguing, uh, we also, I think, derive from Auerbach's brilliant analysis the insight uh, that those multiple representations are not just a matter of people in the history of the world you know, willfully or arbitrarily just deciding to show the world in one way or another. Rather, these representations determine different ways of seeing and experiencing the world. And I really would argue that we cannot underestimate or understate the power of these representations to shape what we think the world is. You know, when we're reading Auerbach, uh, and he makes this contrast between the Homeric uh, narrative and the biblical narrative, the biblical narrative being a narrative of depth, uh, an iceberg narrative, a narrative where most is not shown. We may find ourselves just kind of saying in response to that insight, yeah, but isn't that just how a story is supposed to work? Isn't that just what a narrative is? Isn't that just what a representation of reality in literature is supposed to be? And isn't that just the reality that is supposed to be represented? Isn't it the case that people have depth? Isn't it the case that only a few things in any given situation are worth telling? Isn't it the case um, that uh, anguish and humiliation and tragedy shapes people but shapes them along a vector, a moral vector of what we can call development. Uh, <clears throat> if we find ourselves saying that about the biblical narrative, as uh, Auerbach has uh, presented it, then I think we're proving the point that I'm trying to make here. Because the fact is, and of course this is whether or not we have any uh, familiarity with the Bible at all, uh, it long since entered uh, so to speak, into the DNA of our culture. The fact is precisely that representation of reality that we get in the, in the biblical stories long ago shaped our assumptions about what reality fundamentally is uh, and how it works. And um, the recognition that it didn't have to be that way or doesn't have to be that way that recognition is secured precisely by Auerbach's contrast with the Homeric world, uh, where uh, representation works very differently, and the world that is represented accordingly is uh, very different. It would be a kind of mind-numbing, almost psychedelic thought exper experiment to suppose how we would see the world today 
if only the Homeric narrative had been there all this time, rather than that biblical narrative uh, as well. Okay. So, that is a one-lecture account of the uh, last reading on our course. That's Auerbach's account of the Scar of Odysseus. Um, a brilliant essay, I think a very profound, very moving essay, one that we really need to know about. But uh, uh, for our purposes, as we move to the very last moment of our work together uh, over the last 13 weeks, um, I think it is very nice that we find ourselves, so to speak, back at uh, the beginning, um, taking up the ancient topic of mimesis, which has been with us ever since we were looking at Plato, uh, and somehow seeing all over again how much consideration that topic merits, and in what way it needs to be considered, and in what way that consideration of the topic of mimesis is properly and even uniquely uh, a job for the literary classroom. So that gives me a place to end this lecture and also a place to begin the next and the very last one where we'll try to say, we'll, we'll try to offer some ways in which we can answer or begin to answer at least the question of our course, which is what the study of literature is fundamentally good for. Auerbach has given us, I think, a very, very important uh, road to, got, to, to walk down, uh, which is uh, given by his attempt not just to talk about these texts, but to talk about the subject matter of these texts, what they are actually about, the phenomenon they set before us, uh, and, and give us a chance to understand, in this case, the phenomenon of uh, mimesis. Uh, and we'll start from that uh, next time. Okay, thank you very much as always for watching.